What's up, guys? We are on air, and we have a special, special event today with an awesome guest. Uh, Mr. Bobby Chu has been so generous with his time to come and share some amazing knowledge. So let me put a real quick message in the chat that we are live. You might want to hit on the play button. And uh, let me turn down the volume on that, or else we're going to get an echo. But cool, so if you haven't been to uh, you know, these storyboard, storyboard art events, we're doing some really cool stuff and bringing you some guest speakers uh, this year. But the format here is kind of like, you know, very informal. And then the chat window there, if you guys have any questions, you want to put it into the chat window. Um, so before I get to you, Bobby, let me, let me throw this up too, because uh, I want you guys all to get inspired by what we're going to be talking about, because I think we're going to touch on some really, really key things that is probably not often said in the art world. So get ready for that. And I want to show you this. So let me do a quick screen share and show you guys how you can connect to what we're doing here. So let me put this full screen. So one, you guys need to connect with Bobby. Uh, he's been an amazing resource for a lot of people, and we're going to get into all the great things that he's doing. But let me put this on screen so you guys can see that. Uh, certainly uh, look him up, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, you'd be amazed at the, the type of materials that he's putting out there, uh, most of the stuff for free. And certainly if you want uh, to check out our stuff, uh, here it is as well. Look us up at uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, all the rest, um, storyboardart.org, and uh, that's the website. So uh, the other thing is share your images with us. So if you get inspired by what we're talking about, a lot of people draw what we're talking. Uh, I love that stuff. Um, please just post it and, and share it with, with the group. So cool. With that, I want to bring in Bobby. Let me just uh, stop my screen share here. <laughs> hey, everybody. Bobby Chu, thank you, sir, for coming. So let me give a little bit of uh, a background on you. Obviously, if you haven't, if you guys out there do not know who Bobby is, what, um, you know, just do a quick Google search and it will just blow up. You have been, uh, you are a juggernaut in the art world and uh, creative director of Imagination Studios. Uh, founder of Schoolism.com, uh, right? Online education resource. Um, and I, I definitely want to get into all of that as well. But and in addition to all this, you are a very accomplished veteran concept and, and development artist working in film and animation, correct? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and a <laughs> humble guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, so, in fact, uh, I want to start off by asking, can you kind of give us a, a, a quick summary of how you got into becoming an artist? And, you know, maybe what was your path from, let's say, as a young, as a young artist into becoming a pro? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I just want to thank you for having me on here. It's always a pleasure to meet other people that are passionate about, uh, you know, good, genuine education. You know, anybody that does that is, uh, is, I feel like we're on the same team. So it's a pleasure being here talking with you. Uh, definitely check out storyboardart.org if you haven't heard of it. And um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I pretty, much, I pretty much cleared the schedule for this conversation. So, you know, we can dive in as deep as we want or- Thanks, buddy, appreciate that. <laughs> my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, so how did I get into art? And that almost feels like there's a few different points of entry that happened. You know, like uh, probably a lot of artists out there, you get into art and then you don't get into art and then you get back into art and then so on and so forth. So if I had to kind of go back to just like, you know, go into the key moments, okay, before I really took art seriously, uh, I would have to definitely start off um, when I was about two or three because it was unique you know um, one day my my parents my mom actually saw me drawing on the walls you know I'm a little kid a toddler yeah. and drawing right. on the walls and uh, my mom sees it and instead of freaking out on me she just said okay hold on and she grabbed the computer paper. You remember, Sergio, when we had the computer paper and it was all stuck together? Oh, uh, yeah. You got the little perforated holes on the side. Right. So she had a bunch of computer paper and she pasted it all along the bottom of the room because I'm a tiny little kid. That's my <laughs> thing, right? And then she said, okay, 
now draw. And, you know, so instead of getting upset at me for drawing on the walls, I, you know, I have the the type of mother that would actually. Well, see, that's that's super forward, right? Because most parents, I think, who have kids who are artists, like they want them to be engineers or doctors or architects, right? The traditional stuff. What about why did your mom? Is she just artistic, and why did she do that? My mom was my first art teacher for sure. You know, I remember drawing a, a tiger. Uh, I must have been like four or five. I was like, "Hey, mom, look, my tiger," and she's like, mm, "The perspective is off." You know, and it's like I'm four or five years old. I don't even know my own name pretty much. I don't even know. But uh, she said that to me and she was like, adjust the feet. You know, the ones in the back, raise them up a bit so that there's perspective. And I, I totally remember that that one little very simple lesson um, that sometimes, you know, teaching, you still might point that out to people, <laughs> you know, like 20 something year olds. Uh, and so that was kind of like my entry point in, into like the first memory of me really loving art, right? And uh, then you know, I, I started growing up and you start growing up and my parents are like, wow, Bobby, your art's great as a hobby. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all right, whatever. Right. Okay. Then it clicks and in. So my path all of a sudden changed to, um, you know, become a lawyer, become a business person. My dad, he has, you know, always been a, his own kind of, he's owned his own business for many, many years. Um, so, you know, that was kind of part of my path growing up, right? Art is great as a hobby. And so it was encouraged, but <laughs> professionally, not as much. Sure. Um, I went into business school. You know, I took that path. You did. High school. Where, where did you study business school? Okay. Right. I studied in Toronto, Canada. That's where I'm from. Yeah. That's where I am right now. Um, and I studied at a university called Ryerson University, downtown Toronto. Uh, I went there. I took the classes. And it took me literally three days to start drawing in the margins, starting drawing like elaborate sketches in the margins. And then, the, you know, by the end of the week, I was bringing some like watercolor to math class and stuff like that. By the second week, I was I was writing notes in the margin and drawing these, painting these elaborate paintings in like accounting and statistics class. Um, only went to one exam, and that was accounting. I brought some pastels. I painted a cat and I left. You know, it was a multiple choice question uh, exam, and so I failed everything. Right. I showed my report card to my mom and she she was like, what does E mean? I never seen an E before. Does that mean excellent? It was <laughs> oh, damn, right. Amazing. I said, no, mom, I, I, you know, I failed everything. And she said, OK, well, I hope you know what you're doing because it looks like you're going to art school. So I said, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to apply for the hardest art school I can possibly find here in the Toronto area, which was uh, it's a college called Sheridan College. And so um, I applied for that for their hardest program. At the time, it was animation. Didn't get in. Went to Art Fundamentals. Did that for a good long time. Um, for a year, they take the top 5% and they allow them to pass the, uh, the portfolio review, OK, and directly into a live uh, drawing test. Back then, it was a live drawing test. And you'd have to draw in front of all your instructors in a room with all the other candidates. They would say, look to your left, look to your right. Only one of you is probably going to make it. It was really intense. Drew this you know, literally eight-hour drawing test, got into animation. And then, uh, and then I thought I was going to be an animator. You know, I thought I wanted to be an animator started learning started learning how much work i need to put in to become a good animator <laughs> and uh but i always had this kind of thing in the back of my head which had nothing to do with animation which was i want to be able to i i would love to be able to paint um fictional things completely realistic you know like photo real kind of stuff and i always wondered is that possible so that's what kind of led me towards um, a lot of like the live action uh, 
work that I've done and my love of creatures because they're all fictional. You can't, you know, if you draw a girl, lots of people draw girls and there's nothing against that, you know. Um, yeah, popular but, topic. Right, right. But if you draw a girl, you know, she has red hair, she has blue eyes, she, she has, you know, red lipstick. Um, people won't say, oh, well, you copied, you know, J. Scott Campbell's redheaded girl, right? They won't say that because there are redheaded girls out there with blue eyes and red lipstick. But say I, I painted a creature that was pink with purple polka dots and had a giant, you know, unicorn horn that spiraled. Mm -hmm. If anybody does anything remotely close to that, they will go, oh, you copied so-and-so. You know, and I like that idea where you can't get away with um, things that aren't original anymore. You know, you, you can't get away with that as much when you're doing fictional creatures. Right. No, I love that. That's the, that's the spirit of, like, innovation, right? Of pushing uh, what has been done and, and trying to throw your unique spin on on new stuff, right? Yeah, and you know, uh, another part of it is, so you try to be a great artist, you know, uh, if you don't succeed, nobody draws like you, nobody tries to emulate you, and you are invisible. But you're not trying to be invisible, you're trying to get jobs, so if you become very visible, you know, you really work hard and you really, 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 really work hard to, you know, hone your craft. Um, you become like Frank Frazetta. You become uh, Jim Lee. And all these other people start emulating, emulating your work. They right. try to copy your work. And if your style is not based off of enough knowledge, enough you know, like it's more like a flash in the pan style, then you're gonna find a lot of people are gonna be able to copy your style and uh, pollute the whole internet with stuff that kind of looks like yours. And to the layman, all of a sudden Frank Frazetta, a person, you know, us artists look at so highly, all of a sudden these laymans will go, like my uncle will be like, that's cheesy. Yeah, because right. it's so, you know, it's all over the place. Right. So and that was something I, I consciously okay. really thought about, right? Like I, I didn't want that to happen. So, you know, fictional creatures, photo real, something that feels like it's a 3D model, that's going to be very difficult for people to emulate. Yeah, speaking of which, let me do a quick screen share and I want to bring up some of your images so we can show people exactly what you're talking about. Um, so how did that, so you went to, going from school, let me know if you can see this. Um, there we go. So, uh, so as I scroll through these, I want to know. And obviously, you've done work. You've worked with Tim Burton on Alice in Wonderland films. You worked on the Men in Black films. Uh, doing, you know, working with the best out there. How did that go from from let's say graduating your early years in art school and working your way up to becoming a a seasoned pro and having your own unique style? Well, yeah, like. Uh... Great question. That's, that's something that a lot of people ask me about, you know, because it doesn't happen like a straight line. It didn't happen like a straight line. You know, it was like um, I graduated college. I graduated literally what, you know, uh, many people would consider the best college, the best program in college. And I left and I couldn't paint. You know, I my painting was like, it was okay, but if I saw that portfolio, I'd be like, you're not ready yet. Um, and that was really, you know, I didn't feel good about that, right? Like, I felt like... So the seed of curiosity was planted in your head, right? To become a great artist. Yes, yes. But it was almost like, it was like a quest, right? A quest for that knowledge that only a few people have you know, that high end kind of knowledge and uh, and where I went to look for it, I couldn't find it. So with every great problem becomes, you know, a lot of times they become great opportunities. And uh, if it's a really big problem, then it could spark evolution, you know? And I feel like uh, that's kind of like what happened. You know, I was looking at a lot of blogs at the time, those, those blogs, that's what was hot at that time. There was no, you know, Twitter, there's no, there's no Facebook. Um, 
there wasn't a lot of things. So blogs was the hot thing. And I would look at all these amazing blogs from all these other people all around the world, and I was stuck in Toronto. So it was kind of like looking over the fence, peering over and seeing all these amazing artists out there and just going, how do they do that? How do they do that? And uh, then on a trip to San Diego Comic-Con, my very first trip, which by the way, I'm going to be there next weekend, if you guys are going, if anybody's going. Um, so on my very first trip. Yeah, like, Comic-Con is huge. Out. What's that? Oh, I just want to say, yeah, Comic-Con is huge. Just to reiterate that point is a lot of people are chatting in about, uh, you know, your artwork and stuff, but uh, that's a great way to meet artists, right? At Comic-Con and, and have, you know, juggernauts like you be there. Exactly. So I went there and uh, got to hang out with one of my favorite artists at the time, who's one of my best buddies now, uh, Steven Silver. And uh, during a dinner, I was talking to Steven Silver about... Uh, the Norman Rockwell, the old Norman Rockwell uh, on or not online school. I almost said online, but his school, the famous artist course that he made with his friends, you know, and, and for those of you that don't know the famous artist course, you would sign up, you would get these books mailed to you in the mail, takes you a few weeks, you do the assignments and then you mail it in, takes a few weeks and then you get back your assignment and somebody has scribbled over top of it. Hopefully Norman Rockwell himself, most likely not, but <laughs> you would right. get professional, you know, knowledge over top of your stuff. And I was like, you know what? Um, I want to do a 2000 version, right? And that's what I told Steven Silver. And he was like, that sounds amazing. I said, you can teach people all around the world and you can draw over top of their stuff and talk to them about it. And this is during a time where nobody was doing that. We were literally the first. What year was that? That was 2006, uh, mm -hmm. 2005, 2006. And so... And correct me if I'm wrong, there was no tech there, right? There was no, like the social media stuff, the, like the huge social boom media had not hit exist. yet, right? Oh yeah, social media didn't exist at that time, really. Like YouTube was like maybe one years old. Uh-huh, right. So, you know, created, after he said, yes, that sounds like a good idea, I said, great, and I will watch your lessons to make sure that they're good, okay? And he was like, okay, sure. And I was like, great, free education. Now all I have to do is build this school. And that's how schoolism came about. And then I just asked other artists, other painters. Jason Seiler taught me a heck of a lot. He's painted for Time Magazine, Rolling Stone, all this amazing stuff. He has his own techniques. And then Sam Nielsen, uh, he's very much like half artist, half scientist. He really taught me about how light works um, down to the photons, you know? And that those three people were the start of like this mission to find the best knowledge in the world. And that's what truly got me into, uh, you know, doing actual work in, uh, in big films. Yeah, because this is one of the things that I tell people all the time is that you have to seek out the knowledge to get where you want to be. Oftentimes, even if you go to an art school, they're not, it's not delivered on a, on a you know, silver platter. You actually have to kind of search for this stuff and find it out. And the funny thing about your story is that not only did you search it out, you created a platform to offer that same knowledge to others. You're absolutely right, Sergio. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've interviewed a lot of artists throughout the years, throughout the 10, 11 years or so and something that I found similar with every artist was that uh, really high level artists they don't stop if they aren't given the knowledge on a silver platter you know they will continue to look for it if they don't find it in their school they will look elsewhere they won't just sit there and just complain about it you know they're gonna go out there and search for it and if it isn't out there if it doesn't exist that won't stop them either. They will keep going until they invent it, you know? And that's, that's what I found similar with every great artist. Every one of them has that and just one other similarity. Everything else is completely different, you know? Where they grew up, religion, race, you know, everything is completely different. Uh-huh. And actually, I, I find that that's, that's a great point you bring up. I often think of this as this, funny and very 
a very inclusive kind of brotherhood, if you will, of, of people, of artists that come together because exactly what we're talking about through school and work and all the various projects I've been on, there's been language barriers and even just social barriers, but the one thing that kind of unites us is the art and creating unique and interesting work. I love artists, you know, because of those things that unite us. Another thing that I love about artists is that we all went through the same path, and that's a path of wanting to be able to do art, right? Doing awesome art, and the art that we are thinking we want to do in our heads looks different than the art we're actually doing for those first bunch of years. So for literally years, every successful artist has totally failed for years in the beginning and never gave up and kept going. I love that about Yeah, that's, that's super powerful. <laughs> it's kind of like, that shouldn't be disheartening because I tell people, like, you have to get through that moment. In fact, it's the journey that should be enjoyable. And when you're talking about visual storytelling and and you know creating uh, really cool illustrations and concept art, it's really hard. So to do it to be a great musician right off the bat is unrealistic. It's, it's the same with art. Yeah, no, definitely. So let me let me ask you. Let me transition a little bit um, into the other stuff. And like we're getting some really great questions on the feed, and I invite everybody to go ahead and post your questions there. And we'll we'll, we'll definitely get to them. We're gonna have a Q and A session at the end of this talk. Um, but the the one thing that I wanted to bring up is that there is there is a stigma, right, with artists. And of course it, it probably has been true at some point of the starving artist and um, and being like very difficult to get into the business. And this is a lot of things that I see from younger guys who are trying to do this. They they just like dabble at it and they feel like it's something so Un unreachable that maybe they they don't even consider that a possibility so what in your opinion uh, would be a a path for a young artist or somebody who looks who's looking to be a pro and make a living out of this stuff what do they need to do first of all look at there's so many that's such a good question there's so many so first look at the the people that you're getting advice from you know if you're in school who are the people teaching you Number one, who are the people teaching you? If you go into any subject, say I go into business and every teacher that's teaching me are all people that tried to create their own business and failed at it, what are they gonna tell you about starting your own business? They're gonna say, oh my gosh, it's super hard, it's not possible, don't even try it, right? Uh, if you're a mu musician, same thing, right? But say you are hanging around and you're getting taught by um, you know, all these successful musicians, Michael Jackson and so on and so forth. And these are the people you're getting advice from now. What are they going to say about becoming a musician? They're going to say, heck yeah, you can do it. You just got to, you know, put in your full heart. You do not, you can't consider trying if you only try it at 40%. You're not going to get, you know, it's like if I took... Say this little Apple pencil is uh, a stick, right? I'm trying to make some fire, okay? If mm -hmm. I just go like this for 100 years, am I going to get fire? No. I'm going to get a nub, and that's it. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> you got to put in your whole entire heart into it. You got you to gotta put in, like, way more effort to make a transition. Anytime that you're making a transition from one way of life to another, you're going to need to put in a heck of a lot of effort. You know, uh, I constantly, I don't know why, but I always think metaphors and stuff like that. So I kind of picture it like a spaceship getting out of the atmosphere. They burn like two thirds of their fuel before getting out of that atmosphere, right? But then once you're out of that atmosphere, even though you burnt two thirds of your fuel, now you can just go, you know, and you can travel around so <laughs> after you get past a certain point, right? It becomes way easier. So stick with it, put your heart, your soul into it, find your true potential not the potential you think you have, but really, you know, stretch it out and see 
how far can you truly, truly push yourself? Yeah, you're tired, stay up. Just stay up one time and see how it feels. See if you truly needed to sleep or not, you know? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta like one of our, our other guest speakers says, you gotta love it, right? You really need to want this kind of stuff and have the passion for it. And coming from you, Bobby, that's, that's super inspirational. And I want the guys to know why, because one, the, the, the projects that you've worked on, obviously working on build, big films and, and development work, you've also even created your own uh, children's program and you even won an Emmy for it. Is that right? Yeah, right on. Thanks. Yeah, and I think it's amazing. So can you tell us a little bit about that project, how, how by you know, being in what you're doing and creating the space and the opportunity for yourself, that that led to creating this project and eventually the recognition that you guys deserve? Right. So, um, so how it all happened, right? How it all happened was, uh, I have these friends, uh, Jim, uh, Bryson and Adam Jeffcoat. They were classmates of mine when I was in college, they graduated a year before me after college, they moved to London for like 10 years. They come back, they moved back to Toronto momentarily. And then Adam moved back. Jim stayed here. Uh, I invited them over you know, over to my home for uh, just to hang out, have some drinks, catch up, and we're talking. And I started telling them, I was like, you know what? Um, I, You know what I always dreamed of when I was a kid, the secret little dream that I would do that I wouldn't really talk about? I would read these comic books, right? And I would look at the pictures and I would kind of just like stare intensely at the picture, trying to force it to come alive, like, just start moving. I won't tell anybody, you know, and uh, nothing happened. Of course, nothing happened. But then I, I said, you know, with today's technology, with these tablets and things, man, we can actually make that happen where we actually put together, you know, people can actually make a comic book and have it come to life in a child's hands. And of course, everybody was like, yeah, that, yeah. That sounds awesome. Why don't we do that? And we all kind of just stare at each other. And then we're like, yeah, I guess, you know, you put that good idea out there. Now you kind of have to do it, you know? <laughs> um, Great. Yeah. So then that became like two years of uh, after work, weekends, anytime I was in town, we would meet up and uh, just kept trucking along consistently trucking along, even though it's slow, it took us two years. We put out this app. It was the first uh, fully animated 2D comic book, right? Actually, let's see if I could bring up a little, I don't know if I have it on here, but anyways, uh, the comic book, oh, but yeah, maybe we can point people to the app store where they can find it. What's the... Yeah. Um... Sure. So this is what the comic book looks like, Nico and the Sword of Light. And let me see if I could... Yeah, awesome. You know, so parts are animated, but then also each panel and the title pages are three-dimensional. You know? Oh, cool. There's a nice parallax going on there. Yeah. And so, you know, each panel is animated. So anyways, um, you know, full music and sound and all that good stuff. Took us two years, put it out there into the world, into the app store and everything, and uh, it flatlined. It flatlined for a good two, two or three weeks. Okay. You know, but uh, like I said, anytime you're making a big transition, you're going from one thing that you're used to to another thing you're not, there's going to be struggles, you know, so we all anticipated this. I was telling everybody, we got to get ready for the bumpy road ahead of us, even though it might be smooth now, might be bumpy later. Did that when it flatlined, we were ready. We said, we're going to keep plugging away, kept, you know, approaching uh, influencers, asking them to review the comic book, this and that. Have you ever seen Horton Hears a Who? Of course. So, you know, like uh, they're all trying to yell, they're all trying to yelp, you know, until right. somebody out there can hear. That's how I felt. That's how we all felt, you know, <laughs> like we're doing this tiny little thing and we're trying to get enough traction where 
the bigger people can hear us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then after a few weeks, I get this email. It's from the head of all iTunes stores. Okay. All of them, right? So each country has its own iTunes, and each country has its own head of that country. This was the one that umbrellaed them all. Okay, and he said, um, you know, I like your app. I saw you put in a, a request to update. Uh, it's been approved. I suggest you turn it on now. I said, whoa, that's, that sounds kind of weird. I get my iPad okay, and I, right. I go on the app store and I see Nico in the Sword of Light, front page, banner, right? And I was like, oh my gosh. I go on to appannie.com, which is an, you know, a website you can go to to track your apps, uh, featured. Nico and Sword of Light featured in like six or seven countries, the US, uh, India, Canada, Brazil, Germany, the UK. It was amazing. It was amazing. That's awesome. And then by the end of the week, we were featured in over 20 countries and number one in, in like 36 countries, right? And then everybody started calling. All the you know a lot of wait, but let me let me ask though is um, what 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 happened? <laughs> Did the head of that iTunes store see your content and want to publish it, or was this that snowball effect just waiting to happen, and then it just the snowball just started rolling? Um, I'm not sure. I think it was a little twofold. So I you know I have I have a friend that was talking with the people at Apple and uh, mentioned my app and uh, you know he was talking to some pretty big people and as well we had a lot of influencers big influencers talking about it like techcrunch.com um, that was huge you know but also with every big thing that you do you kind of have to think about it strategically because Anything big is not easy. So the strategy was we want to make a story, right? That's the idea. We want to make a story and we want to put it out there in the world so that if we sell it as a movie or whatever, uh, it's already existing out there in the world. And this way, people won't mess with it as much. That's what we felt. Mm -hmm. You know, I've right. sold the show before and then it got butchered. And, you know, it's like 10% of kids like dogs. Let's put in a dog character. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so we didn't want that to happen again, right? And so when we put this out there into the world, I I don't really, it's, when we put it out in there to, into the world, we had two strategies. One was that it was a 2D fully animated comic book, first of its kind, right? So anybody that loves 2D animation is gonna like it or be into the idea. Hopefully, um, the other is that uh, the whole technology side of things, right? It's a it's a first animated comic book, first uh, first of its kind. So we could approach tech people, and we can approach people that love animation. You see, so the strategy all of a sudden became like. Um, what people are going to see, they're going to see the numbers of downloads. They're going to see the ratings that you get on the, your app. And then they're going to determine whether or not your app is good, if it's popular or whatever. Right. So you essentially, you prove yourself with the following that you're getting. Right. But, you know, who knows how much of it was actually talked about just because of the technology, not the story. You know, if it was made into a TV show or a movie, does it take the technology with it? No. Right? right. These people are going to look at it and go, is this a good story? Well, it got this many ratings and this many downloads. So, yes, I think it's a good story. Right. Right? So that was our strategy. And that's how that, I feel, had a big part about how we kind of broke through our little atmosphere. Right? And I uh, got the the bigger guys to notice. That's fantastic. And I think um, you know you're touching on a bunch of things that I want to hit because you know continuing the conversation about how an artist can make it nowadays. And you mentioned influencers. You mentioned social media. Uh, you also mentioned kind of talking to the right people and making the right connections. 
So this might sound overwhelming for, uh, let's say, a younger artist starting out there. Um, and again, we're getting a lot of great feedback, so we're, we're going to get to all your questions out there. Definitely keep those coming, because at the end, we're going to try and hit up as many as possible. Um, uh, because we're getting questions about freelancing, and can you be a freelancer, and, and what do you do about that kind of stuff. But just to summarize, how, what would you recommend a path for somebody who's looking to get into this stuff? What's like an important trait that they need, or a certain series of things that they need to do? And this is probably, you know, I'll leave it open, but I'm assuming this would probably be over the length of a career, right? Yeah, that's a huge long answer, but I'll simplify it for you. Yeah, give us the bullet points, because I'm sure we could talk days about all these things. Think about what the top 5% of the people in your industry do. When do they get up in the morning? How long do they work? How passionate are they about their stuff? Do they exercise? What kind of stuff do they eat? You know, like every little detail and start doing that. You know, like I'm in the studio today. Um, it's like a little bit past two, 2.37 right now. You know, I got into the studio at seven in the morning. It's Saturday. I love it. You know, get passionate about what you do because there's way more worse jobs than drawing cool stuff for a living. <laughs> correct. Yeah. <Very> correct. <laughs> you can be hauling garbage or something. We were laughing about this at, at Lucasfilm the other day. It's like <laughs> the stuff we're doing, even though it can be hard, it beats a lot of other things, right? Definitely. Definitely. That is kind of like the easiest way to distill all of that. Like, what should you do? Think about what the top 5% do. If you want to be and in the top 5%, that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Let, me, let me just uh, you know, add on to that. How, how do you find that top 5%? What if you don't even know any of these guys? Is it just as simple as doing a web search? Or do you, you know, open books that you're, that you're fond of and kind of seek, seek those guys out? Yeah, I feel like now there's truly no excuse because of social media, because of all, all that stuff. I see, you know, directors writing back to tweets, you know, like how accessible do you want it? You know, like <laughs> right. That's yeah. The never there's never been a time like this, right? That we get access. Access is almost completely wide open. Almost, right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, um would it be worth it to say if you took an online class like your class or a schoolism class you know you have the teacher's ear right you're paying good money they have a great reason to respond to you not just a small answer but a nice lengthy answer you know uh that's that's a super simple way to do it um and a lot of times just a phrase, just a, a few words, as long as it's the right words, could change your whole way of thinking. Right? It's super interesting that way. And on the flip side, if you're getting taught by the wrong teachers, there's certain things that they can say that will completely change your way of thinking for the wrong. Well, let's 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 evaluate that. What would you consider wrong? Because that there's, you know, we have to define that as to what are some of the things that you should watch out for. I, I okay, guess I should put it. Uh, you say to your teacher, "Teacher, I want to be a character designer," and they go, "Well, you know, there's only like two or three character designers for a whole film, and a lot of times they work on more than one film. So these people, it's very limited. I wouldn't become a character designer." You know, like, uh, I wish I could take these teachers, put them into my room, and kind of lecture them a little bit on what I think a teacher should be. You know, teachers should be uh, very patient. Somebody that is not going to cut people off, you know, cut off their potential just by telling them that there's a wall there. There's no wall. There are people, even if there is a wall, there's people on the other side. They got past the wall, you know? Uh, teaching is like the one of the most, most important jobs. It shouldn't be taught by people of lower caliber, in my opinion, because those people, well, can they teach somebody to become somebody of a high caliber? 
Now, a lot of times, high caliber students will still come out of a school high caliber, but it's not because they were taught by mediocre, low caliber teachers. It's because they got that info and they didn't settle. They were like, this info stinks. This isn't what I'm looking for. I'm gonna keep looking. And they might ban up with some other classmates, you know, and push each other to really excel way past their teachers ever did. Now, do they need that teacher? Did they need that school? Do they need to pay, you know, five figures or whatever a year for that school? You know, I don't, I don't think so. I, I just don't think so. Yeah, that's great. It reminds me of this quote that, uh, uh, no school can teach you to be a good student, but you can be a good student in any school. And I, I think that's a very valuable thing to to realize that for me, learning is self-learning. Somebody can teach you and influence your career, but uh, you have to take that knowledge and, and go with it. And anybody who's going to stop you from doing that is is probably a warning sign, right? Yeah, you know, a lot of teachers, I'm so surprised on like, uh, a lot of teachers, they won't do demos. If your teacher is a teacher out there that doesn't want to do a demo for you, that person most likely has something to hide. <laughs> I just want to put it out there, you know, like, <laughs> uh -huh. if somebody asked me, oh, how do you draw a figure, I would have a million different ways to teach them and to guide them. Right. That's awesome, man. Let me let me do a, a quick screen share before we get into the um, the question and answer period because I, I want to once again, if this is something that you guys are 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 into, and uh, here we go. Let me bring that up. Sorry, my camera is wigging out. Ah, there it is. Okay. Um, if this is something you guys are into, I definitely want to hit us up with social media once again. I know you guys are blowing it up in the chat room, and you know if you have questions about freelancing you can also check out the button there that leads us to one of the courses that we have for freelancing so you can check that out if that's something you're interested in but Bobby you've done amazing stuff with your career so far and uh, you know and all in all you are a young guy you have many productive years I'm sure uh, for the future uh, you've won an Emmy you've worked on big movies with the best in the industry so what what is next for you what what's your next goal Next goal, I'm, I'm kind of like in it right now, you know, uh, my big goal, my mission in life is is to affect the art community the, in the most positive way possible, you know. Um, so for me, first, that's education. Education opens up opportunities. It betters people for the long term, you know, and, uh, and I kind of think of it as like, you know, art, however long it's been around, 3,000 years or whatever it might be, right? Um, it's been a conversation that's been happening for 3,000 years plus, who knows? One person discovers something. So, you know, people are just drawing whatever they're drawing, painting whatever they're painting, and then one person discovers, hey, perspective, right? And they figure it out. And then they explain it to somebody else. They teach somebody else. Right, and then that person learns it and goes, oh, one point perspective, but what if there are two points? You know, and then art evolves. All these other people learn it, gets passed on, and other people build on top of it. Everybody's building on top of this conversation. Now, if you're a person that's learned something, has become good at something, share it with the world. Share it because uh, if you, Keep it to yourself. You're not contributing to this, this amazing conversation that's been happening for thousands of years. And you actually have something good and valuable to say, right? To not share it and to not be a part of that conversation, to not affect art itself is not only a travesty, it's a shame. It's a real big opportunity that's missed. You're not okay. actually just giving people knowledge you are becoming a part of art itself and that i think is amazing yeah that it's a loss to human ex existence right that if you don't share your your art out there exactly so our opportunity you know our lifetime you know sergio the one that we're living right now 
it's also a huge important time because of the whole digital era, right? There's like paint, oil paint for like who knows how long. And now we have digital art. And we are the ones that were born during that time and, you know, um, first adopters. So it's, it's even more important that we share what we know with the rest of the world so that we can take this opportunity and become a part of this amazing conversation. It's an honor, you know, to teach people. That's so rad. And, you know, people like you uh, really should be teaching. I think it's, it's very special and, and great. And once again, I recommend you guys check out schoolism.com. And uh, where else would you point people if they wanted to, to find out more about what you're doing and the projects that you're going to be working on? Well, um, I would say, you know, I have a Facebook group, uh, Facebook or a Facebook page, facebook.com slash bobby.chu, C-H-I-U. Um, as schoolism, by the way, you know, we have been not just trying to collect the best knowledge in the world, but we've been trying to make education absolutely affordable to everybody in the world. You know, and uh, the timing of this pod, this uh, webinar, or whatever we want to call yeah, it, yeah, is, um, <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great timing because um, for we're at the tail end of our summer sale, you know? So I always tell people education is just like an investment. You know, if you're going to buy a stock, if you're going to buy some property, you want to know when you're going to get your return on your money. You know, an online education is far more of a better investment, I would say, than a lot of other choices, right? Uh, because of the price. And, but we want to make it a crazy, insane, no-brainer price, right? So you can subscribe to Schoolism right now for $120 for a whole entire year. And that, that's going to be amazing. That's pretty much like less than a, a, a blank sketchbook a month, not even having stuff in the book, right? And uh, the sale ends on the 19th, which I believe is Tuesday. Oh, wow. Good timing. Yes, this is something, if you guys are interested, I totally recommend. Uh, 120 bucks, and you get access to everything? Is that all of your videos and all of the archive, or what, what does that give you? Pretty much. Like, you get, you get access to a course of your choice, okay? We want you to stick with one course. I don't want you to flip channels like a TV. A lot of stuff uh, that is kind of, like, going the wrong way with culture today is our attention spans have gotten less and less and less, you know? So we want to help you with that by kind of constraining so that you are on one course at a time. If you do want to switch courses, you can switch courses anytime you want during your subscription. It costs $1. <clears throat> cool. $1. And okay. you can do this as many times as you want. You know, so you could go through 20 courses by adding on just $20. Right. And then and how many courses do you have now? Just to, if you have a ballpark figure so people get an idea. Um, okay, the number is totally ballpark, but it will be close. I'm, I think around 17 courses. Wow, that's epic. And I mean, I think you guys should see the quality of, of artists you have on there. It, I think Nathan Fox and Dice Susumi, another good buddy of mine in San Francisco, a friend and, and Pixar artist who's an incredible painter, has done work with you. Um, these are people that you guys should really seek out, especially, you know, we're, our focus here with Storyboard Art is kind of visual storytelling and narrative film and the film language and drawing, but you need a wide breadth of, of art education because I think a lot of people come into, especially storyboarding, with a, a, uh, without the drawing skills that they need to get the work done. And I think uh, a resource like, like Schoolism is, is a very smart way to go. <laughs> totally. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> As the creator, you couldn't agree more. That's awesome, man. I think this is a good time. Let's, why don't we open this up for questions? There's been, it's been blowing up in the, um, in the chat here. Uh, everybody is, some people have already are on your Schoolism, which is great. And I think we can knock off a couple of these, these uh, first questions really easily. Because I think Thomas here, he says he's in, in Chile, and he says that access is hard. Can he still do this stuff? 
I think we kind of already know the answer to this. You kind of just said it. Um, uh, maybe yeah, like, can... I, I work in Toronto. You know, I don't live in L.A. Um, it doesn't matter if I lived in Bali. It, it wouldn't matter. I, you know, I do everything online. I started at a point where it was not really heard of as much. It wasn't the norm. You know, it wasn't as frequent. Uh, you guys that are starting off now, you're at a great time because everybody's used to that. Right. And yeah, another question here says, if you're not based in California, is it possible to do it? Bobby just, just said it. I mean, living in Toronto, how often do you travel? I mean, I know you have your schedule for the live events that you do. Uh, how often do you travel for work? Is that even necessary now? Um, I'll travel a little bit for work, but I love traveling, you know, so I try to get out of the, get out of the city like around one third of the year, which is a lot, you know, but, um, it's a good time in my life to do that, you know, so been doing lots of traveling. Uh, traveling is like, I feel like it's so important for the soul. You got to travel. You know, you see how people around your country do things or around your city that do things. See how other people do things. And then you can pick the good stuff. Get rid of the bad stuff. You know, truth is in knowledge. Guys, search for that knowledge in, in everything. Awesome, man. That's so rad. Uh, we got another question for you, Bobby. It's uh, somebody asking about your business partner. Apparently, uh, what's it work? What's it like to work so closely with your partner, Kay? I'm sure it's awesome and rewarding. But do you ever face challenges? Um, my boyfriend and I are both artists, and I plan on owning our own business in the future, creating productions and creative projects. Do you have any advice? Yeah. I don't, you know, I, I feel like I have so much advice for like every little question just because I believe like so much in it and I keep thinking about it all the time. Uh, yeah, I, my wife, Kay Asadera, you know, uh, illustrator, character designer extraordinaire, she started the studio with me along with my brother, uh, Ben Chu. So um, how's it like working with Kay? It feels like you know, like usually couples, they live together and then they go off to work, right? And then they see each other after work. Literally every day, except for I think one day in the past, I don't know how many years, 12, 13 years, uh, we have not seen each other. We have not spent the day with each other. Um, that's great. Is that a blessing or a curse? <laughs> so it's a blessing depending on who you are, you Correct. know, what kind of person you are. Some people need that space. And I feel like it will either make you much stronger or break you up, you know, because it's, it's not, it's not just even being married anymore. It feels like being married and retired being married, you know, cause you're just with each other all the time, every day. Um, <laughs> What I would suggest for that person that asked that really great question is um, hopefully you guys can both kind of say to yourselves, okay, I chose you. You chose me. That's it. You know, those are our choices and that's what we're going to live by. And uh, every piece, if we're all pieces, every piece needs a little bit of adjustments to fit perfectly together. So constantly go through that process of trying to make each other fit a little better. Um, a really great thing to do to ask, even if you aren't working with your partner, is just say to them, okay, honey, tell me if you had it your way, what would that be like? If you could have it your way, however you want it, what would it be like? And go into detail. I'm sure there's going to be like, three or four or five things that you can absolutely do. Yeah, okay, sure, I could totally do that. And then that person, hopefully, if you have the right partner, they'll reciprocate that and go, okay, well, what would you want, right? If you could have your way. And then life gets better and better. If you just do this periodically, life gets better and better. So a lot of times um, we have plans, right? A lot of times we have plans and we don't tell the other person our plans. 
we almost kind of assume that they know or or we assume we're going to tell them later on yeah i mean i think it's you're touching on another great we we have to schedule another talk because there's so many issues here that that you're bringing up but uh it just it's it's hard to summarize all these things but you're talking about a lifestyle and relationships as an artist that to me is so important to have that balance and to get that that inspiration on a daily basis it sounds like you found that and you have somebody who reciprocates that for you it's not easy um, but I think you know if you know what you want you can try and find something that's that's compatible for your for your lifestyle so fantastic man I'm, I'm so happy that there are productive and happy artists out there with, with this kind of uh, inspiration to give back. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, so and, and along with that, there's another question here that it kind of ties into this in a little bit in a little ways. So, uh, uh, Leo, I think it is, uh, is asking at the start of your career uh, when you're already working professionally, but you felt like uh, you didn't have time for your personal project and to become a better uh, to become a better artist. How did you find the balance between pushing your career forward and maintaining your self progress? Right. So, if you kind of see the commonalities with every kind of answer that I've been giving, you know, you, you're like, okay, well, yeah, Bobby's talking about these two people being together and having a studio together, but that actually relates to just being together, and it really just relates to being, you know, just alive. You know, a lot of the things that I will tell you, they're absolutely applicable to everything else because like you were saying, you know, life and work, those are two halves. How can you talk about one without talking about the other, right? Um, it doesn't make sense. It's like teaching one person just to box with their right hand, right? Don't worry about the left. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, you know what? I kind of segued so far. What was no, that? I think this is a great topic to talk about. But yeah, you know, it all has to do with career and balance and and getting all your ducks in a row so you can do this stuff. I mean, I I remember I asked a a film director I worked with at Lucasfilm, uh, who's a you know personal. He went to school with George Lucas, and this guy was a juggernaut uh, director. And I asked him. I said, I'm trying to do my own stuff. What do you recommend? The first thing he asked me was, he said. How are your finances? And that kind of it stuck with me. I remember that, and and I said it, because his his reasoning was that you couldn't get forward in in what you wanted to do as an artist if you didn't have your ducks in a row. Basically, you didn't have your act together, and uh, that goes with everything: relationships, finances, and and creativity. And um, for somebody that veteran to say that to me was was really impactful. And I think uh, you represent that as a as an artist and a person. I think that's super important for people to to hear. Yeah. So I like uh, I just wanted to make sure I, I answer that person's uh, question. So that person's question was, um, how do you kind of manage your independent work, your your personal projects, with building up your career? So you know, I was saying, talk about one thing, you got to talk about the other, and they all relate. Well, building up your career means that you need to do personal projects too. That's how I kind of picture it, you know, like um, if you're only working for the studio on their project, that's totally fine uh, as long as that studio is still around, right? Right. <laughs> if that studio goes under, then all of a sudden, and they don't show whatever it is that you've been working on for three years, all of a sudden you're going to go through a really rocky transition. Hopefully not. Um, so doing personal projects, that relates to my career. I have to I have to make room for my personal projects. That's how I kind of designed my life, right? Um, I used to do art books. Or every once in a while, I still do an art book. I just have a little less time now. You know, the, the animated comic book, Nico and the Sword of Light, um, you know, that was very much a personal project for a good while. Um, doing the gallery show in Paris. Uh, I was in Paris for the month of June, just doing a gallery show for Disney, uh, for Alice Through Looking Glass. You know, it's it's great, but it's all it's also really great because 
personal projects you could put out there into the world. You don't have to wait a bunch of years until a movie comes out or whatever. And that gives everybody an opportunity to kind of catch back up and go, oh yeah, that, that Sergio guy. Oh yeah, yeah, do you, you, do you see that project he's doing now? Yeah, and then, you know, spreads around. If you kind of leave it a little too long, especially nowadays, like I was saying, people's attention spans get less and less. People, I find, you know, could forget about you. Right, yeah. <laughs> with the way things move so quickly now with social media and tech, it's, it's amazing how things uh, last out there. Um, there's a ton of questions. We, there, we could go on and on, but I want to hit up uh, a couple of these that have kind of the same theme. Um, and I think it's touching on some of the stuff here is, have you ever had a storyboard or a project that, that failed? And probably the follow-up there is, well, what did you do about it? Yeah, uh, something that didn't achieve its objective, yes. You know, do I call it a failure? No. Yeah, you good know, point. Like, uh, That's a good point, yes. Talk about right? that. Right, like, you, uh, you are trying to make artificial light. You know, you're going to go through a whole bunch of things that, a whole bunch of, you know, first prototypes that don't make its example. Right, like Edison went through like ten thousand or something like that, or a couple thousand before he invented the light bulb. Right, same kind of thing. Um, there's lots of projects that I've done in the past or whatever, and uh, I thought it was going to be good, wasn't good. Right, so so a lot of these you might not even know were projects. Perhaps it was just something I thought, this will be good. I'll put it up on my Instagram. Oh, there's no traction there. I put it up on DeviantArt. Oh, there's no traction there. Yeah, I think logically this, is, this isn't going to fly. These little plant people that I just drew, it's weird. All these people like it, you know, and I'm going to draw more little plant people. Oh, more people like it and so on and so forth, right? And, and so it's more like I'm a scientist. Here is experiment one. Okay, that didn't work. Let's evaluate that and let's make adjustments for experiment two. I'm never expecting experiment one is going to be successful. That would just be weird if it was. Right, there's a, the, <laughs> I, yeah, I think you'd probably get jaded if you were like number one all of the time. Uh, that probably wouldn't be. Yeah, uh, and that's dangerous. I feel like that's building you up for a giant disaster because you cannot truly call yourself successful until you've failed and bounced back from that failure and kept going. You know, if you don't, if you never meet failure, you never know if when you do meet failure, it topples you over and you can't get up, right? So anybody that's actually failed anything and you're still here, good on you. You know, you just went one step closer to becoming successful. Right, that's awesome. <laughs> I've heard that before too. Uh, you'd be surprised at people I think admire what actors and filmmakers and artists and all this kind of stuff and they see the big guys that are out there. But a few people know the, the behind the scenes story of some of these guys and I've, I've heard enough stuff from, let's just say, many top filmmakers that you'd be surprised what actually happens uh, on their way to getting to the top. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of these people, you know, you meet them, you talk to them, no matter what kind of thing they're into, if they're successful, a lot of these things they will say as well in whatever way they say it. You know, we all think about these ways because that's what stops us from just crashing and burning and never getting back up. Yeah, and uh, let me just summarize this because there's a bunch of the same questions here coming through. But along those lines, and people are asking about, you know, is two D is two D art still alive? Is um, is is uh, you know three D the way to go? And all these things. But in your mind, especially talking about success, uh, who's successful for you? What are the artists that you follow? Um, maybe even alive or dead, I suppose. It's just a wide open question. And what would you recommend? What do you see in the future uh, for for the medium of these so called successful paths? Right. Huge question. Okay, so uh, the one, 
that I'm going to say I feel that person successful might not be the most successful, but it's definitely one of the top. It's just the first thing that comes to mind. Um, my good friends, uh, Lauren Lanning and Sherry McKenna, you know, they created Oddworld, the video game, right? Yeah, I know Oddworld. If you remember, you know, uh, Xbox, it came with every Xbox, right? It came with every Xbox. It was like their Super Mario when Super Mario came with every Nintendo. Uh, they still own their own IP. They are, I think, they're like one of the only people from that era that still own their own IP. They broke the mold, how everybody was telling them, this is how it goes, and they, you know, create their own path. And uh, not only are they very balanced individuals, but they're very successful, you know? So you can't have just the business or the career being a success. It's like every, you know, kind of cheesy movie out there. It's not the money. It's not the success. You have to have a good balance of everything. Same with family. That's why I, I stayed in Toronto because I wanted to see, you know, my family. I wanted to be there for my grandma that's turning, you know, 99 this year. You know, uh, I wanted to be here for to watch my nieces grow up. You know. Yeah, awesome, man. It's not just about skills. It's about attitude and your your whole, whole let's say, let's say holistic <laughs> career focus. Yeah, man. something that I could, if I could, if I may, you know, just Please. to kind of, what I would love to see people do is start to think more and more about how you would design your life. If you could have it the way that you want it, how would you design it? Because people won't say, oh, I would just do nothing. I would just, you know, drink beers all day and watch, watch sports. They wouldn't do that. You know, they would get bored pretty easily. Think about how you would want your life to be paint a picture, draw it out, write it out, and then actually do it. Actually, I was doing a talk um, last year for CTN, talking about something to that effect. And then I dug up this. This is um, a list that I wrote in 2005, just before I started the studio. Right, It's things that I wanted, things that I didn't want. And then I put it away for like seven, eight years. I never read it. And then I picked it back up and read it again for this uh, CTN talk. And I was very happy to see that everything on there I'm actually, you know, I'm doing right now. So uh, for those of you that couldn't read it, I can read it to you. You know, one side says my dream job. The other says uh, what I don't want. So I want to be close to work. I work about six minutes away from where I live. And now everybody in LA probably hates my guts. But uh, yeah, I live like super, <laughs> super close. They're probably um, just jealous. Be close to family. You know, I'm very close to my family. Be in a position um, of amazing potential, right? When you're independent, definitely you have that. Um, be in a position where I'm constantly learning. I go to like seven to 10 workshops a year. <laughs> you know, I'm learning on, on such a constant. Uh, you know, travel the world, affect as many people as I can in a positive way, right? And it's, it's super nice. I got to get this. Yeah, you um, need to get that. Well, we'll definitely uh, take a screen grab and and share that for people because that's so awesome. One, uh, you know, I've done that for myself, and I recommend other people do that too. But you're, you've you've achieved those goals. It seems like, and it's it's about, if I can interpret what you're talking about, it's about setting your mind to something and actually following through yeah. with the steps that you're doing. Yeah, you create a plan of how you're going to get from where you are to where you want to go. And then that plan's gonna change. <laughs> you know, that's how life works. But you will always have a north. You'll always have a compass of where I want to end up. Right. And if you can have that end goal in mind, let that be your compass. Let that guide your decisions. 
right? If, if you get an amazing job, if I got an amazing job uh, in like Shanghai, an offer to go there, you know, does it align with the kind of life I want? If it's no, then I'm going to say no. Exactly. If it doesn't, it's if not in line with the goals that you've set out, uh, I think the answer is much clearer then. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the people out there listening, what I would implore you to do is to think about designing your life, not just characters and environments and all this cool stuff, but your life, right? How, what kind of character would you want? You know, you want to be, what kind of vehicle would you want to have? You know, start designing this kind of stuff. What, you know, the environment that you're around and your day to day. Fabulous, man. I think on that note, it's, uh, it's been a joy and a pleasure and I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, one more uh, screen share to, to remind everybody that uh, of what, oops, here we go, of where you can find us, uh, Storyboard Art. Definitely check out our website and the resources we have there for visual storytelling at storyboardart.org. And then certainly I want you guys all to connect with, with Bobby on his social media. Check out schoolism.com. And we heard about his offer, uh, his sale that you guys are doing for schoolism. You definitely want to jump on that because uh, these resources are so valuable and it's probably worth the money at any price. But for a low price like that, you guys really should take a look. So awesome. And, and share with us. We're going to go ahead and, and uh, email you guys out uh, the replay. And uh, if you want to check out freelancing stuff, you can go ahead and click on the button on the live event page and see some of the classes that we have uh, offered for that. But once again, Bobby, let me turn off my screen share and, uh, and just say thanks for, thanks for everything that you're doing for the community. Thanks for everything that you've done for artists. And I can't wait to see your path and where you go from the stuff that you're doing uh, in the future. Me too. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, Bobby, thanks a lot. You guys out there, this was super awesome. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, keep it up. Keep up drawing. Keep up the hard work. We'll all connect eventually soon. All right, you guys. Take care. Yeah. We'll see you uh, soon. Can I just say like one last thing? Absolutely. If we're still on? You know, yeah, still you know, if these awesome live streams by storyboardart.org has helped you, or if this talk has helped you in any way, uh, I ask that when it comes to a point in your life when you can give back to somebody else, give back to somebody else and, and we'll call it even. All right? All right. <laughs> I love it. That's so rad. Thanks, Bobby. Take care, brother. We'll talk soon. All, All right. you guys out there. We'll see you. All right.